start now. If people could find their seats, that would be great. We're going to restart with what is probably a, a hotly anticipated session on intersectionalities. Um, so we're very pleased to have uh, today to talk about um, talk about about this Professor Aftar Bra and Pro Professor Georgie Weems, and uh, we're going to start with Aftar's contribution. Um, so I think I'll just hand straight over to, to you, Aftar. Is this? I think that should right, be okay. That should be fine. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is a great pleasure to be here. Um, Mike, is it not? Is it not on? Um, I think it should be. It's on. Nira, is that better? Right, that's fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, Nira and I go back a very long way. Um, we met in Aberdeen, actually, at the BSA conference on sexual divisions of labor, and this was way back during the early 1970s. We were very excited about the topic. It was the first time that BSA had held a conference on this topic. All the big name feminists of the time were there. Unusually for Easter time, it snowed in Aberdeen during the conference. And that was quite exciting, actually. Um, we were drawn to each other because we had recently come to Britain from studies in the USA, so we had both been students. We were both doing our PhDs here, and we were very virtually the only, what Neera described as the visible other women. We were thrilled at the complexity and dynamism of the discussion. Marxism was ascendant at the time, alongside other sociological perspectives, and feminists were just beginning to interrogate these grand narratives. Amongst all this intellectual energy, there was, however, a singular absence of questions of race and ethnicity. We could not imagine how you could talk about gender, class, and sexuality without considering their relationship with, with uh, racialization processes and ethnicity. We had embarked on our lifelong quest for thinking about what many years later was to be theorized as intersectionality. At an interpersonal level, it was the beginning of a precious friendship that has lasted till today. As a political discourse, we know that intersectionality is not new. As Anne Phoenix and I have noted, the idea of what it means to be a woman in different contexts under different historical moments was debated at least as far back as the 19th century anti-slavery struggles and campaigns for women's suffrage in the USA. The famous locution, Ain't I a Woman, by an enslaved woman, Sojourner Truth, neatly captured the idea that woman is not a homogeneous category. Sojourner Truth campaigned for both the abolition of slavery and for equal rights for women. And she talks about class. She talks about the ways in which white upper-class women were treated with great respect, were helped into carriages, over ditches and were given the best place everywhere. But no one helped her, she says, and ain't I a woman, she asks rhetorically. During the second half of the last century, political projects such as that of the Combahee River Collective, the black lesbian feminist organization in Boston, pointed as early as 1977 to the unacceptability of prioritizing a single dimension of experience as if it constituted the whole of life. Instead, they spoke of being actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and advocated the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. In academic discourse, this insight was followed in the second wave feminist debates around the figure of woman as a site of multiplicity. Many anti-racist post-colonial feminists were part of this debate globally. But the specific term intersectionality comes into academic feminist currency to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. It has found expression in the work of especially women studies scholars 
and become a key insight of the field. Nira notes that, quote, epistemologically, intersectionality can be described as a development of feminist standpoint theory, which claims in somewhat different ways that it is vital to account for the social positioning of the social agent. In the case of many of us, and Floyer mentioned this this morning, intersectionality began to inform our work long before the term came into common usage. Hence, Nira's work in the field of intersectionality began with the use of the concept of social divisions in the early 1980s, when, in collaboration with Floya and Thias, they studied gender, ethnic, and class divisions in Southeast London. This is an important and influential text of the time. Nira has published extensively, and her work is cited regularly by scholars in many disciplines. Her book, Gender and Nation, is a path-breaking intersectional study, which has been translated into eight languages. One might be pl uh, pleased with just one translation, actually. <laughs> this book and her research has opened up many new analytical vistas. The debate between the concept of race and ethnicity owes much to the detailed and sustained analysis available in her scholarship. I'm very confident that politics of belonging which is being launched later in the day, will be equally influential. It is an intersectional analysis par excellence and has the term in the title. Another concept which Nira has pioneered is that of transversal politics, which itself is an intersectional concept. It has been hugely enabling in grounding theoretical perspectives in politics on the ground. It foregrounds the intersections of global social conditions with local contexts. As always, Nira's work is theoretically sophisticated and empirically relevant. Typically, it is also collaborative, often bringing together feminists from the North and South in dialogue at conferences she organizes. Many important edited collections have emerged from these highly productive intellectual and political conversations. Her work has been marked by methodological advancement. A recent research project, Identity, Performance, and Social Action with Kaptani, is a methodologically innovative initiative which uses participatory theater to study identity, especially in relation to refugees in East London. Neera and I both have had a troubled relationship with religion, a rejection of some aspects of organized religion, especially when it comes to prejudice and discrimination against other religions or social groups such as gay people, and certainly against fundamentalist manifestations of religion. But we are both attracted to spirituality, which plays an important part in our lives. In a fascinating autobiographical article in issue 97 of Feminist Review on religion and spirituality, Neera discusses her politics and relationship with religion how she equally values spiritual and secular spaces. When she lived in the United States, she could, she says, call herself a progressive diasporic Jew, secular or religious, and be part of the political left at the same time. When she came here, among the British left, especially Marxist, however, there was less tolerance of any need for spirituality or ritual and prayer. <coughs> Her PhD research is about Jewish religious groups in Boston area in the USA in the late 1960s and early 1970s. This research appears to have profoundly influenced her view on spirituality. She says that she learned about the power and beauty of ritual and praying and how they bring aesthetics into ethics and resolution and affirmation in times of confusion and distress." Unquote. I have a wonderful memory when Nira and I were both at a conference in Vienna. And in the evening, we went for a walk and ventured into a beautiful old church building. We were so moved that although neither of us is Christian, we all we lit candles for peace. Spirituality does not live in the confines of any specific religion, nor indeed is it confined to religion alone. When she moved to the UK, Nira began the practice of inviting home family and friends once or twice a year to share sp spiritual reflection. I have been one of the friends who has had the pleasure to share these gatherings with her. One of the important events of the year is the Passover Seder, 
to mark the liberation of the Israelites from slavery in ancient Egypt. We've got together at Nira and Alan's dining table where the traditional text is read in a modified form, followed by everyone around the table sharing what liberation means to them that year. One of the key parts of the ritual is a four or five course dinner, and Nira and Ale are wonderful cooks. <laughs> On the other hand, Nira is one of the founding members of Women Against Fundamentalism. WAF is anti-fundamentalist, but not anti-religious. It believes in maintaining secular spaces. There is sometimes a degree of confusion about the notion of secularism. Some think of it as referring to atheism or agnosticism. This view is sometimes associated with extreme forms of rationalism. The other meaning of secularism refers to the separation of religion from the state, although in practice many states such as Britain are imbued with religious ideology. As Nira points out in different publications, it's the second sense of secularism to which women against fundamentalism subscribe. Nira describes WEF as her political home, and she has made major contributions to its work. We shall hear more about the work of WAP later in the day. She has also been an active contributor to the professional development of sociology in Britain, as well as internationally. She has held offices in professional associations, such as the British Sociological Association and the International Sociological Association. Apart from her major interventions in the academic world, she's regularly involved in other social and political initiatives. She is frequently called upon to work in the context of expert advisory teams, for example, as part of the International Initiative for Justice in Gujarat, she was a member of the women's delegation to India. She's a founder member of the International Research Network on Women in Militarized Zones. As is appropriate to her interest in intersectionality, she's now editor of the Palgrave Macmillan book series titled The Politics of Intersectionality. I often wonder where Nira finds all this energy to do all these things. Nira, it's been a privilege to have you as an intellectual fellow traveler and a friend. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you very much, Akhtar. I think we'll move to Georgie's contribution and then we'll have more time for contributions from everybody else. I kind of reversed, re reversed this a bit because um, the route that I've known Nira is really through the acting, thinking, politics and sociology in that order, although of course we know it's all together. Um, it says a lot to the power of Nira that yesterday I was teaching access students as a tutor at Tower Hamlets College in East London and today I've been promoted to a professor at I'm Roehampton sorry. University. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, anyway, I'm very proud to be a tutor at Tower Hamlets College, um, and somehow or other I got associated on the, um, on the emails that went out with Roehampton, and it's been impossible to remove it. Um, but but th thank you anyway. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I first met Nira um, in a Women Against Fundamentalism meeting in, um, in late 1989. Um, I'd, I'd been studying Bengali in Bangladesh and travelling in China um, when the fatwa against Rushdie, um, the book burnings and the demonstrations and the uh, formation of WAF, Women Against Fundamentalism, had taken place. And my understanding of these events were framed by my, my own experiences of having worked as a youth and community worker with women and girls in Brick Lane um, and of campaigning against campaigning against racism in housing and education in Tower Hamlets since 1984, and of trying to learn more about the colonial and post-colonial histories of Bangladesh whilst I was living in that country. So then, as now, the political and cultural spaces in Bangladesh were sites of struggle between the religious right and the various uh, religious and non-religious secular voices. 
And this was only 18 years after the War of Liberation, and memories of the genocidal killings and rapes of Hindus and Muslims, trade unionists, teachers, and the burning down of villages carried out by the Pakistani army and their Bengali allies were still sharp. They still are sharp. Returning to Britain, it was impossible to see both the support and opposition to Rushdie's book and these events in Bangladesh as isolated. Those continuing struggles in, in um, Bangladesh were part of the same um, conflicts. And this was particularly in the light of the fact that individuals accused of war crimes in 1971 Bangladesh had found asylum in Britain and were known to be active in mosques and youth organisations. I'd heard about WAF as I'd worked with women from South All Black Sisters, um, some of the founder members of WAF, as a youth worker in the past around issues of domestic violence, forced marriage and racism. And in WAF, I listened to and debated with feminist and anti-racist women from a wide range of backgrounds in a context that was always transnational. By that, I mean that the discussions around what I later understood to be intersectionality of social divisions and of how power operates through the contesting discourses and practices of religious fundamentalisms, um, patriarchy and racism incorporated those complex global dimensions of power. So Nira was one of those women, very um, important central woman. Um, but unlike anybody else who's spoken before, I actually I didn't know anything about her academic role or academic background. I didn't know that she had an academic role and an academic background. Mm -hmm. I knew Nira as an activist in WAF who used, used her earlier political experience in theorising the discussions. However, it was those WAF discussions with their empirical and theoretical transnational and intersectional analyses, although I wouldn't have used those words at the time, um, <laughs> that led me to returning to do a master's and then a PhD in anthropology. Uh, and this is very significant because I'd, I'd studied anthropology um, before, but I'd rejected it as too close to colonial projects after having received a degree, and I'd sort of not wanted to go back to it at all. Um, so, so in a sense, um, Nira's involvement in those discussions led, led me back into ac academic study. So as a part-timer, I carried out my research outside of academia, feeling very marginal, very marginal and isolated for much of the time, but was encouraged by Nira's warmth at several matters that, moments that mattered. Um, so the ethnography of my PhD focused on events and discourses in East London in 1993-4, to four, following the racial attacks of Kudus Ali, a student at the college where I worked, and the election of a British National Party councillor to the local authority. And during that period, I'd been involved in an anti-racist anti women's organisation made up of women from many backgrounds uh, who lived or worked in Tower Hamlets, which was active in organising women to defeat the BNP, and it was called Women Unite Against Racism. Um, I'm going to just put up, as I'm talking, I'm going to put up some slides which are, kind of, which are sort of uh, mainly comments made from, by women in Women Unites Against Racism. And I'm just I'm putting them up there to, to, to illustrate how some of those discussions um, and, and, and positions uh, and, and contests which, we, which were analysed in such detail in uh, Women Against Fundamentalism found their way through... Um, the activism of Women Unite Against Racism and also later on into my own theorisations around, um, around Britishness. <coughs> so Women Unite Against Racism, uh, like WAF, was an example of a group of women from a range of positionings and perspectives who worked together in dialogue towards a co common political goal, in this case to defeat the BNP at the forthcoming election. Uh, and my analyses of wars, we call it war, wars activism and how Bengali and non-Bengali women were constructed in dominant and co contesting discourses at that time formed a chapter of my thesis. But I've never used that material in any subsequent publications, partly because I felt too emotionally close to the women involved. But I've chosen to focus partly on some of those issues today as it's appropriate that both my own involvement in the creation and activism of war and my later theorisations about Britishness have been influenced by the input of Nira, SBS, and other courageous women from those WAF discussions and activism. 
And the experience of being part of those discussions had a lasting impact on my understandings of power and how fundamentalist politics works. Um, and another important point is that th those issues continue to be important as the activity of Women Unite Against Racism um, at the time has become almost invisible as the discourses of multiculturalism that have dominated our view of the recent past um, has meant that such secular activism um, is just, is, isn't really um, visible. Um, so, the background of um, Women Unite Against Racism was, um, was a vigil that turned into a riot outside the London hospital, um, which led to a group of women meeting together and deciding that um, they were silenced in the movements that were taking place um, and, uh, and, and meeting and liaising with organisations such as South, Southall Black Sisters um, and other women from a range of organisations to um, have a, a, a meeting and eventually out of that mass meeting to come together and uh, form uh, a, core, a core group of about 30 women who uh, campaigned uh, very uh, tightly over an eight-month period to get rid of um, Derek Beacon. Um, and part of the, just to put up um, some, some more of these. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so th there were various things happening and the as, as I said, the kind of threads of, um, of uh, Nira's uh, uh, analyses of intersectionality, I hope, are going to come, come through um, in this. There were about at least 16 anti-racist organisations um, operating at this time, but the women within WUR felt that, for a whole range of reasons, that they weren't able to be effective within, the, within those organisations. Uh, but I remember more than one person and one very significant person comment, commenting, commentating that um, wouldn't it be very, isn't it very divisive to have a women's organisation? Um, there was already 16 other organisations, so we found, we found that quite um, amazing. So, so one of the things was the very focused activism and the other, um, the other issue was around the representation of, um, of, of the whole group and specifically of Bengali women within the group. Um, and that formed part of my later analyses and how the constructions of Bengali women as, as passive and as of newly politicised was, was one that dominated um, at the time. And um, I'm not going to have time, obviously. I'm not going to go through all of it. But um, an example was of um, uh, this woman, Julie Begum, talking about how she was uh, represented on the BBC as somebody who was very powerless in stopping um, the riots, um, a, a picture of her holding out her hands and trying to stop the mass um, advance of, of young men outside the steps of the hospital. Um, so, uh, just to quickly have a, have a look at what the aims and the activities of Women Unite Against Racism were at that time um, and how that activity worked. Um, they collected and disseminated um, information, provided space and opportunities for women to meet and organise, um, enabled women to take place, part in a whole range of anti-racist <coughs> activities and, and of course we're talking about secular spaces, secular activities, um, to support women who are experiencing racial violence and harassment, a mass voter registration campaign of women, um, uh, because part of the reason that Beacon had got elected the councillor was because he'd only won by eight votes. Um, the provision of creches, all these things I'm sure are very familiar to everybody here. but. Um, very, very invisible, many of them, to any of the other organisations outside. And part of the reason for that, I'm just going to shoot through this, uh, was because much of the uh, campaigning took place um, in domestic spaces um, and also in primary schools, um, 
women were making telephone trees. They were Bengali-speaking women were phoning other women, uh, getting them to vote. Um, uh, other women had set up voter registration stalls in primary schools, which enabled um, many, many women to go in and register to vote. There's no way of knowing how many women um, were empowered to vote through those processes because um, it, wasn't, it wasn't ever recorded. Um, but one of the results of all of this, which is just the point which I'm going to finish on, is how all of this um, activism was represented in the dominant discourses of the media of that time. Uh, it was of um, a, very, a, a great reluctance to see women unite against racism as a, um, as a group of women from many different backgrounds working together a, a, a in, it, towards a single um, issue. Um, and also um, many, many comments in the press which focused on the women as being um, newly politicised. Um, and that was something that, um, there's a couple of examples here, um, which the women in uh, were were very keen to counter. Um, and I just uh, finish off here with a couple of quotes um, uh, which were circulated through the War Bulletin and which came out of the kind of discussions that happened in uh, Women Unite Against Racism. Um, around uh, how women became politicised. So, sorry. So, to conclude and to say thank you to Nira. Um, you might not know it, but the debates that you were involved in had a direct link to these events back in 1993, 1994. Um, and many of the women who were involved at that, in that time um, and were involved in other groups as, as well have disseminated out to other activities, um, not just in Britain but in other parts of the world as well. And so what we've been talking about earlier is very... Um, academic and theoretical, very important discussions um, have not been limited to academia. Um, and that's why I think your work is so special. Thank you. Thanks very much to both of you. Um, if, if we could have some contributions, that would be great. Celine has a, a microphone here to pick up. Problematically, of the, uh, of, the, of the women as Bengali women, uh, Georgie, to what extent, uh, although I've been pretty sure that they would be Sileti speaking women, to what extent do you think that the lack of awareness and suppression of the fact that the Sileti population, like the Cockney population in East London, are the victims of linguistic stigmatization and oppression um, might contribute to the communal difficulties? Um, which communal difficulties are you referring to? The representation of Bangl the Bangladeshi population and <coughs> As, well, as Bangladeshi and the reputation uh, 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 of people say East End working class as having um, cultural clashes uh, when in fact um, at least one dimension of their oppression, the, the fact that they speak languages, that their home languages are languages without a written tradition, which are routinely uh, rubbished by the dominant ethnic groups which hegemonize the political discourses within which they live, um, tends to remain unanalyzed. 
there is a huge issue around around class and language in East London and in the, the politics between people who are from Saleti speaking backgrounds and tend to be from uh, originally more less mid, let me say less middle class backgrounds. The women who were involved in war, when I talk about Bengali women, I could pop, I, I could of course problematize it. I could I could look at the categories of Bangladeshi and Saleti and see how they're mobilized. Um, the, these women were Saleti speakers. They were also English speakers. Um, one of the reasons um, I would uh, say that though that particular movement has become invisible is also because those women moved on and moved out. So after having been involved in uh, war, they they went to they they were at university. They got jobs which led them to other, not just other parts of work in London, but other parts of the world as well. Um, and uh, talking talking to people, one of, one of the reasons for that was was the kind of um, sexism that they experienced in trying to um, operate within the um, jobs market within Tower Hamlets. Um, which, which made it quite difficult for people who were, for, wi for, for women who were from that background, to obtain, um, to uh, obtain jobs or, or get involved in particular organisations like the ones which had been, um, uh, which they'd been finding excluding at that time way, way, way back then. Um, I think that's that's all I'll say about that. But I could have a very long conversation with you about those Saleti um, standard Bengali dynamic dynamics in East London. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contributions. I I, I thought they were very you know, enlightening and, and excellent. Um, this is a question to after Bra, um, and you talked about Nira's work and your work and also Floyd's work and the relationship between religion, spirituality and, and, the, and the, the public um, manifestation of, of these kinds of debates. I was wondering if you could just elaborate in terms of the kind of scholarship that um, Nira has, 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 has developed and, and worked on over the years, and yourself and people like Floyd, to what extent do you feel that these more complex, nuanced debates and scholarships that, that feminists have been working on have been translated into the public sphere in terms of the debates that we're seeing? Because religion and, and, and debates around the secular and religion are, seem to be very much presented as polar opposites and in very fixed terms. So as, because Nira's work and, 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 and yourselves and Floyd's is very much engaged in the very real world and is based on activist and reform, social reform and, and, and debates around justice and human rights. To what extent do you feel that this kind of scholarship is, or, or you could uh, elaborate on, on, on the way that we, we can translate such ideas into the current debates? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, obviously th th there's a link between activism and sort of theoretical kind of frameworks. And uh, I think the thing with Nira's work is that she's been involved in both. And I think in terms of the influence, academic work, how it influences actual public policy or actual politics, you know, is quite complex. Sometimes a lot of the work we do in academia is just, you know, kind of goes underwater, no one really thinks about it. But I think the, the whole um, uh, strength of Nira's work has been that she has actually made those links all the time. Um, I'm not sure how, how far we think exactly the same. I'm sure that if we started talking about it, Nira and I might have certain differences. But the whole question of religion is a very complex one. And, uh, and, and, I, and I think that that's where Nira's strength lies, that she's actually looked at questions of spirituality which are important, you know, which some people actually disavow. I mean, they think that, you know, there's only one kind of politics, which is secular politics, and the other doesn't matter. Now, I'm not one of those people. And certainly that's where Nira and I have actually kind of, you know, found common ground. 
um, that there's spirituality and spiritual needs, but at the same time, religion itself gets fundamentalized, gets racialized. And so one has to kind of take certain positions. But these positions are not very easy ones. They are not very uh, straightforward ones. And therefore, it's, uh, it demands of us kind of a constant rethinking of, of our own political positions. Yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question, but... contributions at the moment? There's somebody at the back. Was there something we can Yeah. So, um, just, I think it's more of a comment than a question, really. Um, I uh, really appreciate um, Abhay you bringing in this question of um, how spirituality and religion are dealt with in academia, because um, I personally find that uh, in the geography department where I work at the University of Sussex, you know, it's not okay to take seriously um, spirituality or religion. And I, I, I'm more inclined towards your view, as I understand it, this morning. And so you kind of have to um, keep that separate. Um, although I've started to do a bit of work, which is academic, on religion. And I'm currently working um, with a number of faith groups in a city which is multi-faith in, in Peterborough. Right now, I've just come from fieldwork this morning, going back to it this evening. And what I wanted to say is that I think that some of the academic attitudes which kind of are aggressively secularist um, are also elitist, because within these religions, which can be very patriarchal, very colonial, very violent, all the rest of it, there's also liberatory potential. And for many people who are new migrants, this is absolutely critical. And if often it's a working class um, thing that religion is held as liberatory or emancipatory or a source of hope. <coughs> and I think that um, academia has a lot to learn about this. So I don't think it's just about, and I don't think you're saying it either, but I think if I'm understanding you, maybe, maybe you'd agree, I don't know, um, that it's not just about spirituality. It's also about struggles over religion. And um, that's, I think I think it struggles over religions, in religions, and against religions. I think it's, it's, a, it's that kind of whole gambit of things that one needs to be sort of you know, aware of all the time, and, and, and all the time kind of struggling against <coughs> these different things. I think you're right that in certain political contexts, religious ideology can be liberatory, but it can also be very oppressive at the same time. So I think it's, 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 again, historical specificity and looking at those concrete situations and what happens in those concrete situations. Yeah. I think we'll take one more before we move on to the next round table. Yeah, I'm just uh, also, I guess, a comment. I mean, I'm a bit surprised how, I mean, I associate Mira so much with defending secular spaces. And I think bringing it back to the whole issue of intersectionality, I think one, I don't know, I might be wrong, but one reason, you know, there, well, I mean, I think that uh, the, the struggling of um, various forms of, um, you know, stereotyping, generalizing, we heard some from Georgie, but yes, uh, there is, of course, the, you know, I guess, fundamentalist, secular one, but I would actually like to hear from Nira uh, herself, you know, how you feel about the way the discussion went now, uh, because I certainly would be surprised if that was kind of the end of it in terms of how I would perceive you and, and your work. So would you mind saying a little bit about it? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is a whole session about <laughs> fundamentalism in the afternoon. I'm, uh, so I think a lot of it um, should be really discussed here. But it's um, interesting and, and important that in discussion on intersectionality and activism, how issues of religion and spirituality is now part of the main uh, debate and, and domain. I think in 
Tara's speech, it was very clear that our engagement in issues of spirituality was very much in the personal domain rather than the political domain. And, and I think this is um, very important. Um, I define in, in the book on politics of belonging as an intersection of the sociology of power with the sociology of emotion. And I think the issues that we had just talked about are absolutely uh, crucial. I think it is very important to approach the issues that you talked about, for example, in an intersectional way and to look at it not just as kind of, um, I mean, of course, belief in religion or in any other ideology can be very empowering personally. But we have to look at the political and historical as well as the personal context in which this is taking place. And I think a lot of the reason people need religion now more, both materially and spiritually, is because what is happening to the state, the privatization of the state in terms of actual support and services and so on, which is now not available from where it used to be uh, uh, available before, definitely for migrant and, and, and so on, but also um, the whole um, kind of crisis in terms of um, what I call in, in, the, um, in, in the book the, the security spatial rights of people not knowing where they are located, where their future is going to be, with whom and in what way. And therefore, we cannot detach narratives of religion and narratives of spirituality when we analyze it sociologically, politically, from these issues. So I, I, I thank you, Nadia, for, for kind of um, helping to, and I think this is what Samia was talking about, about the public debate about secularism and, and about multiculturalism that in a way ignore this political and historical context in which we are talking about. But no doubt the uh, discussion in the afternoon will mm -hmm. continue to develop it. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think we should wrap up this session now because we want to leave time for transformative pedagogies, which is next. So thanks so much for that. Good, thanks. The last session ended on um, sort of giving us food for the soul, but after this, we are actually going to have food for the stomachs as well. And so, in that, with that in mind, um, we are going to try to um, keep this session not too brief, but it's going to. What we're going to do is um, sort of reformulate it. Everyone here is a is formerly a PhD student no, of Nero's. No, no, oh, no, 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 is it? No, postdoc, postdoc. A student. It has been, let me say, has been somehow affiliated with Nero in their early careers, let's put it that way. And the room is also, has other current PhD students of Nero's. So the wonderful idea um, that mm. the panel had was that they would just say a few words um, in, about their experience of working with Nira, and then we would open it up um, more generally. So without further ado, and I'm gonna let you um, introduce yourselves if that's okay, I'm going to um, give over. <laughs> okay, so thank you Molly. Uh, I'm Ulrike Witten, and uh, I'm currently based at a Dutch university, though it's free university, Amsterdam, not open university. Um, because of the time, I th and I, I'm not talking about my work, so you might turn to our friend Google if you really want to know what I'm working on and publish. I rather was tempted to give a short like anecdote when I started my MA um, at Greenwich University, which was in 2002. Uh, and it was, of course, very, very exciting because I just had moved from Germany, from Hamburg uh, to London. Uh, so that was exciting <laughs> anyway. 
Um, and after a couple, I think two, three weeks, uh, we had a seminar with Nira. And I remember that after our, let's say, academic talk, she said, uh, I'm driving to the House of Parliament in the afternoon. Are there some of you who want to join me? And uh, of course, I was very keen. And at that time, uh, there was a sociology student, uh, Mariam Sanusi. She, she was in a wheelchair. And I think another Romani study student, Pat. So four, four of us going by car. And uh, because of Mariam, we even had the chance to uh, get a very good parking place in front of the house of Carmen. Uh, and it was exciting because, yeah, <coughs> being so, so recently in London and then immediately going to, to the heart of the British Empire, democracy, whatever. I can't remember, I can't remember what the topic was about. <laughs> so it was more about the atmosphere and yeah, Ellen was with us, or we met Ellen, uh, I think at that place as well. So uh, I think that was very, very particular about my, um, my start of friendship and yeah, academic and intellectual inspiration by um, Nira that I experienced her so much as a mensch. So like, you know, you do academic work and some of our colleagues already uh, phrased this very, very nicely, you know, this kind of passion, political passion, intellectually, intellectually um, working and also very much integrating new people and people from different walks of life, which is very special. Also the gatherings at her home, <laughs> we really like that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I very much appreciate uh, having had uh, the honor to come today and also meet Nira and continue our work and yeah, be in contact <laughs> with all of you. I mean, there are some more inspiring persons here, of course. Thank you. Or can you hear me actually here? Yeah, yeah? okay, that's nicer actually. That's okay with you. Um, my name is Omot Erel, I'm at the Open University. I got to know Nira in 1995 when I started doing my masters at Greenwich. And at the time, I was looking, I, I was, uh, I came over from Germany and I was looking for a place to do my masters. And when I first read her work, I immediately thought that this is actually the place I want to be and exactly what I'd been missing in my studies until then. Um, and one of the things that so many people have said, but I still feel I have to say that again and again also, is that it was really very welcoming. You know, Nina's concern and support for her students went really far beyond the classrooms, I would say. And um, she was welcoming and always very thoughtful. I'll just give you a very brief example of this. When I was so excited to have my telephone interview with Nira to be admitted, hopefully, I was hoping to the masters. Uh, I was expecting all kinds of questions, and um, but the first thing she said was not, you know, uh, can you explain to me the equivalence of your uh, degree to <laughs> to ours? But instead, she said, let me ring you back. It's going to be too expensive for you otherwise. Mm. You know, and this is one of the. And this was before cheap phone calls, of course, right? <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I think this, this, this is one of the small examples that for me really encapsulates um, Nina's concern for her students in so many different ways. For example, our classes took place in the evenings and always Nina would make sure that um, people had a safe way of getting back home from a rather isolated campus in the dark. Ulrike has also mentioned getting lifts from Nina, so did I, and <laughs> it was great, that was fantastic. Um, I'm not a driver, so whenever I sat in Diana's car, I just sat back and relaxed. But um, <laughs> I got to know that Nina's driving style was distinctive when years <laughs> later, <laughs> I met one of the speakers at the Greenwich Seminar Series, again at another conference, and she didn't remember me for my nice smile or my incisive comments, but she said, oh, I've shared a white knuckle ride with you in Nira's <laughs> car. <laughs> so, and this really brings me to something that I think was a really important part of Nira's teaching, which is uh, that she's great at building networks and um, encouraging also her students to do so. We used to have those bi-weekly series of seminars at um, Greenwich Sociology Department, and unfailingly, Nira always made sure that some of us brought some bottles of drinks, bags of crisps, or 
things like that. And she'd introduce people to each other. Um, I got to meet many distinguished speakers, some many of whom are here today. And you know, one of the things that I found really remarkable is at the time that despite myself being aware of their distinguished academic profiles, it was really not an intimidating atmosphere. On the contrary, um, actually, I would say that much of the very positive impression I had of British academia's ethos of collegiality and also of um, genuine dialogue was actually not so very British academic at all, but very much owed to Nira's personality, I'd say. Um, yeah, and we said we were going to introduce ourselves very briefly mm -hmm. here, so I've, I've got lots of other things to say, which I would like to raise later. But um, I also would like to briefly read out something um, from our friend Nilufel, who was a master's student at the same time as myself, and then later on, of course, your PhD student. Yes, that's right. And I think this is really important, not only because it's a wonderful letter, but also um, because I think Nira has had an influence as a teacher really transnationally, globally, and that is one of the things that I think um, we really need to, or I, I think are fantastic about her teaching. So let me just read to you. Dear friends, meeting Nira has definitely been one of the most inspiring and pivotal turn of events in my life. And the inspiration began before I even met her through the positive energy that she conveyed in her response to my letter seeking information about the Gender and Ethnic Studies Master's program. It continued with her incredible support to not only myself as someone who was going back to university after a long gap during which a revolution and war had happened in my country and right after having lost my father, one of the main pillars of my life, but also to my family who were going to join me for that year in the UK, my mother and my two young daughters. Without Niela's compassion, support and inspiration, I would never have made it through the UK at that point in my life or completed the master's program in one year. Niela changed not only my life, but also that of my family, I can say. And certainly, if it was not for Niela's intellectual brilliance, social activism, and overall inspiration, her commitment as a PhD supervisor to her students and her role as a persistent mentor who was <coughs> able and willing to put in the necessary time in her very busy schedule, and certainly when necessary, even in her own home, in an airport while traveling to attend a conference, I would never have succeeded in completing my PhD, one of the achievements in my life which continues to drive me forward, even in the hardest moments of life. I was indeed so very fortunate to have the privilege to be Nina's student and for sure otherwise. I would not have gone on to complete my PhD while working full time for UNICEF Afghanistan. I'm forever grateful to Nina. For sure, the moment we both came back into my PhD examination room and were told that my PhD was accepted was one of the happiest of my life. Thank you, Nina, for everything and being here that day with and for me. I also want to thank Nina for her continued friendship since that time and her kindness to my family and I during our visits and stays in London. Uh, every interaction with Nina is motivating, educational, and just positive and forward-looking. You have continued to enrich my life in so many ways through your academic work, ideas, views, experience, research, as well as through social activism, feminism, and anti-racism. Through your strong and dynamic personality and through your friendship and love. Um, let me in addition thank Alain, who is also very admirable and who has also very kindly, generously welcomed us to your home. Um, I do, however, also want to say that we have together gone through some hard times and perhaps the hardest, being the loss of our dearest Tijen, um, another of Nira's PhD students, whose memory you so tried, you tried so hard to keep alive and which is so very much appreciated by all of us who loved her for the incredible and beautiful human being that she was. She is missed today, but I'm sure you and other friends amongst the participants, um, um, sorry. <laughs> Okay, there's so much more that I can say, but I know that I have limited time and others will say what I might have missed. Hope you enjoy this special day, Niela. Okay, thanks. Yes, you. Um, my name is Marcel Stötzler. I'm at Bangor University in uh, North Wales. I should speak into the mic. I really don't know where to start. I've, uh, I've been torturing myself over the last weeks to, uh, 
to think about what to say in my five minutes. Um, and yesterday, um, well, every time I come to London, I go to my favorite yoga place, uh, which was uh, one of the good things of being in London uh, previously. Now living uh, on the countryside in beautiful landscape, but no yoga studio anywhere nearby. <laughs> And the, the, this type of yoga I'm doing is a kind of not the kind of relaxing uh, type, but it's a kind of very sweaty uh, affair where you're pretty close to a heart attack you know, every time. So, I, and last night I was lying there in a dead body pose, and uh, where you're supposedly not to be thinking anything, which is which is good, but I still couldn't stop thinking about <laughs> what to say in my five minutes about how Nero would have influenced me, so I... But there in dead body pose, enlightenment struck, and um, I was thinking that is actually what I should be saying. It's, uh, I think one of the principal influences is this self-reflexivity thing that's, that's going on in, uh, in Nero's uh, writing and teaching. And I think that's probably one of the principal influences, and from from my struggling and um, inability really to come up with a good idea, you can tell that I've not been a very good student uh, in, in, in that respect, uh, not, not at all. Um, I think that is one of the principal influences, the, this constant adhortation to self-reflexivity in the, in, in the writing and the practice of our, of our uh, job. The second thing is, and that obviously Umut has explained that, I think everybody has explained that, is that the, the, the way we were interacting was simply um, a very democratic one. So there was a kind of general sense of a very egalitarian uh, way of uh, interacting. And I think that is the second, uh, the, the second most important or the, the second of the most important <laughs> aspects of the influence. The third one would be that uh, I, I also came from, from Germany, uh, which you probably guessed already. Uh, actually, I also, came, <laughs> I also came from Hamburg. There must be some kind of a underground railway, from, <laughs> especially from, from Hamburg to Greenwich, and, or East London now, I don't know. Oh. Yeah. Um, so I was a student in Hamburg, the way you, you were in Germany in those days, which was quite different from now, I guess, and uh, it would have never occurred to me in my dreams to, to go for an academic career, so that was just not something I would have been thinking about. Uh, um, and I only actually, well, when I came, uh, one of the principal reasons for coming for the MA was that my uh, my BAföG grant was finished. So I was kind of at the end of my state funding for my studying in Germany. And at the time, uh, there was a possibility to get an extra year of funding if you go abroad. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, <laughs> I go. And while I was here, I was realizing, oh, I'm on an MA program, something I'd actually that was no concept in Germany at the time. I said, okay, that means I'm finished if I'm through with this, and, and so it was. And so I, uh, obviously I, I hung around and did a bit of teaching for Nero and so on, and then also a bit later managed to find PhD funding, etc. So And then it kind of emerged that it is actually conceivable to be an academic, which, uh, as I said, I wouldn't have occurred to me uh, previously. And obviously uh, uh, Nero's person and attitude and also the actual teaching obviously uh, kind of showed up the possibility uh, that you can have rather, um, let's say, um, not so middle of the road ideas and still somehow <laughs> eke out a living and, and having a job in this particular industry and uh, that's, uh, that was obviously in practical terms probably the most important uh, influence and, and through a whole chain of 
lucky coincidences uh, uh, that are, that actually came about uh, somehow, uh, which is which obviously wouldn't have happened without uh, the MA with Nero or the, um, the experience at Greenwich. What else? Did I have any other uh, thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I could also talk for another two hours about the, uh, the intellectual side, apart from the um, attitude and practical aspect of the influence, but that would probably be unnecessary because you're all perfectly familiar with that. So I, I think um, <coughs> a lot of what Nero was teaching uh, obviously resonated with uh, things I was also looking for or trying to think about in a different language, quite literally a different language and also theoretically in a different language. And also that was an important thing which emerged in the teaching and also subsequently in the, in the uh, collaboration with Nero and we, we wrote a couple of articles and uh, did some research together and, and uh, that was also interesting in kind of translation terms. So it was a kind of exercise in translating sort of the same ideas from different theoretical languages into each other. That's, uh, and that's something I've tried to keep up also with other people. Like, like when we co-wrote these articles, it was really hard work. It was not quite like the yoga class that I mentioned before, but not totally unlike that either. And since then I've I kind of made a habit of co-writing articles with, with other people, which takes an enormous amount of time and is, is much more work than just writing an article on your own, but uh, it tends to be much more interesting and uh, tends to result in things that you didn't know before, <laughs> which I believe that's called research. but. Uh, I think it's not necessarily always like that. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Um, God, goodness, I had the same thoughts in terms of, you know, how can we possibly say what we want to say about Nero and, you know, for his contribution to. Um, who we are and, and the type of scholarship we do in five minutes. But I think, um, I mean, all I would say is just echo the comments that have been made before me, that um, I came to the University of Greenwich um, via a friend of ours, Nikos Trimnikliniotis, who also um, was part and parcel of, of our master's group. And um, I was just looking for something, having done an undergraduate, um, law degree, I was looking for something that actually meant something to me and could also reflect my lived experience. And I think this course, the Gender and Ethnic Studies, was fantastic because it really was based on a lived reality. It was trying to link the theory with everyday life, with issues of social justice, human rights, equality, and how we negotiate who we are, where we are, and what we can be how we can live in a, in a society that's just um, and equal or how we can aspire to that. And I would also just mention that the University of Greenwich, the sociology department and the work of Nero's and Floyd's was so pioneering, um, so progressive in terms of other institutions um, and, and academic disciplines that it really did and continues to have an impact upon our scholarship today. And I think it was through the work um, of Nero's and the engaging um, with that material in that time that gave me the space. And I think for me, that's what Nero's work does. It provides space. It provides space to be able to think about ideas moving away from fixed categories. So you don't have to think about religion or the secular or, or, 
all, all these kind of fixed categories that we work with, but you can think about them in complex intersectional ways. And it's that intersectionality which translates into the personal that then I think really can have an impact in the public space. And it was through the work of Nira's um, where I w felt that I, I could develop my ideas. And it was through engaging with my fellow students um, where I became aware of the work, for example, of South or Black Sisters and I had the opportunity to go and work. Uh, with SBS for a while, where you can actually see these ideas in practice, where we had activists on the ground trying to think about these debates, or trying to think, take theory and put it in practice, and then actually try and achieve um, some real change. Um, so I think it's important um, for a number of us in terms of how we take these ideas and how we develop them, and, and then how these this kind of space provides um, an intellectual um, scholarship that is so much more nuanced and so much more complex. And I do work around issues of religion, um, and I do work um, around issues. Um, I, I, I'm based in the law department um, at the University of Reading, and it all always occurs to me when I when I'm doing my work or when I'm trying to develop some of my ideas that actually how many disciplines and how many academic institutions, um, universities in the UK are actually so fixed and rigid that the work of NIRAS and the work um, that was developed at Greenwich and the University of East London now is so much more than what we even have in disciplines today. There's so many disciplines actually are, are retracting in terms of, you know, they work around fixed boundaries and ideas in terms of how far we can go. So it's so important for those of us who try um, and, and engage with this work and then try and think about these things differently in, in, in the public space to be able to translate um, and take these ideas and translate them um, to continue to draw upon this work. And because for me, the work of Nira's um, and, and is very personal and it was very personal when I first came to the University of Greenwich I mean, because for the first time I felt as though I wasn't by myself that somehow being a Brummy and being working class and being British and being a Pakistani and, and Muslim and etc cetera, etc cetera, was part of who I am and was okay and I could negotiate and I could um, I was able to better understand theoretically and also that impact in terms of me and, and not be based around fixed um, categories. And I think the work of Nira's is so inspirational because it's so very much needed today because the whole um, religion versus secular, identity versus community, agency versus social coercion, false consciousness, is so fixed in the public space. Um, where, uh, but there are, you know, important contributions for the work of South or Black Sisters, WAF, um, the work that CAS is doing, where you can actually see real change on the ground. And I suppose that's all I would really want to say because the work isn't just theoretical, it isn't just the complexity of it, but it does affect, you know, our everyday lives. The scholarship has had a very real effect on my life in terms of how I see myself, how I feel as though I can engage um, with the public space and with the, the scholarship. And for me, I will be internally thankful for people like Nero and Floyer. And I also think that it's, it's it, it's just amazing that they produced such fantastic work and it has such resonance with us today. So thank you, Nira, for all your contribution. I'm going to say a lot of what Sam said in a way. I, I, I feel that I must have been mad um, many years ago, it was now 12 years ago, um, to have started a master's with Nira because I was relocating to the UK after, after living 17 years abroad in Pakistan. Um, I was a single parent with two children and I was starting up a new international coordination office for the international network Women Living Under Muslim Laws and doing a part-time master's. It must have been completely bonkers. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, it was probably one of the most important moments of my life because it gave me 
um, near as teaching and, and with Floyers as well, gave me the words to articulate, and I think this is something you've been saying, Sam, gave me the words to articulate analysis that I had seen on the ground and experienced in ways that, you know, it was all stuck here. You know, and this feeling of having the words and having the thoughts and having the analysis to be able to articulate that what I had seen in reality on the ground <coughs> in ways that, that could actually move debates forward. And I want to give you a very a, a real life example. And I actually thought, okay, maybe I imagined this example. Um, so I went back into my old emails and I've dug out the email exchange. So if anybody wants the evidence, I've, I've got it here today. <laughs> Um, and it's a very real experience which illustrates how Nira's analysis of women's bodies as, as the collective expression of identities can actually be put into analytical practice in, in activism. This was 2002 um, and I was working at the Office of Women Living Under Muslim Laws and there was the terrible attacks by the Israeli military on Janine. And there was a lot of mobilization going along globally um, and we suddenly got this international alert for action about, which was this dreadful, dreadful case, um, which was a, a young man saying that his sister, their home had been attacked by the Israeli military and the sister had been violated in more ways than one. I mean, the word rape <coughs> wasn't actually used. Um, and then it turned out that the sister was pregnant and it turned out that the sister miscarried and it turned out that the young son had witnessed his mother being raped, etc., etc. There was something that smelt rotten and it was, it was Nira's work which gave me the ability to articulate. I would have had the nose that there was something qu not quite right about this story. But her analysis gave me the words and, and the thoughts to be able to articulate, I think this is a hoax. And it actually turned out to be a hoax, deliberately designed in order to discredit the human rights activists who were reporting on the terrible things that were happening in Janine. So that's a very real example of how that analysis enables actually, you know, effective activism. Um, but it didn't stop there. And that, that was the one sort of the issue of, of, you know, women's bodies as the collective identity. That was very clear um, articulation of that. The other, the other, ish, the other thought um, that, that Nira has inspired and I've used in trainings across the world, and I really, really mean this, there's people who have this thought in their minds in very odd places, you know, isolated Indonesian islands, etc. Because um, I do a lot of sort of training and speaking internationally. And that's about the whole question of the distinction between social location, identity and values. And just as, as Samia has said, um, that spoke to me very much at a personal level. That enabled me to think, oh yeah, I'm not a freak. Um, and, but on the basis of how powerful that felt to me personally, I've then shared that idea. And I go and give a sort of mini Nero lecture all across the world. And I do write your name up on the board every single time. Um, credit where credit is due. And, and that is also, it's very interesting, very often when I get feedback from presentations and, and workshops that I give, the light bulb moment that people report back is, oh, that distinction between social location, identity and values is really a light bulb moment for so many people. Um, and it's, it's impacted, you know, the analysis of international human rights standards and, and the international human rights system's ability or inability to deal with culture in a nuanced way. It's impacted Asian women's shelters in the UK who are trying to understand how to deal with their, their young staff who are harassing non-hijab wearing members of staff, but who themselves are also harassing the hijab wearing members of staff. You know, so these are, these are very, very different spheres of activism and analysis um, that, that have been impacted by your work. Thank you. Um, well, what a, what a wonderful tribute, Dayenu. Um, um, I think that we will leave, um, leave it open to you now. There, there are actually a number of Nira's current um, postgraduate students in the audience. Um, you should feel very welcome to contribute at this moment if you wanted to, but you don't have to. And indeed, anybody who wants to can. We have, oh, I don't know, let's take around whatever, 10 minutes before lunch or something. So, would anybody like to? <coughs> okay. 
not been a student of Neera's, but I loved Cass's phrase, giving mini Neera lectures, <laughs> because, um, you know, and I, you know, when, uh, after hearing the panel and, um, you know, talking to Neera, I've often sort of thought of her as this fantasy, perfect PhD supervisor, you know, that uh, all of us would have liked to have uh, who did PhDs. But, uh, I mean, Neera's analysis, I mean, I moved to the UK in 2004, and um, I was kind of looking around for, you know, feminist groups, uh, feminist discussions, etc. And Geeta said, well, come along, we are trying to revive Women Against Fundamentalism, and uh, the meetings will take place um, at Neera's house. Um, so I sort of started going along to those meetings, and just, you know, all the discussion that happened there, all the things that Neera said, I mean, she has the capacity to, in a phrase, sometimes really sum up really complex issues. And one of the phrases that really stick in my mind that I use all the time without necessarily writing her name on the board <laughs> is, you know, we were talking about the constriction, increasing constriction and the crisis of multiculturalism and she talked about how multi-faithism is repla replacing multiculturalism in Britain. And that sort of really stuck in my mind. And I really thank you for the analysis that you provided to somebody who was new here and just trying to grasp, you know, all that was going on in the public sphere. So I think that as much of an activist as you are, you're also, you know, a really brilliant teacher, even when you don't think you are teaching. So thank you. <laughs> I'd like to add something maybe to this, what, what you were just saying, because I was talking to various people trying to prepare, as everybody said, I also found it a difficult task to say, to summarize this in five minutes. So I thought the best thing is to talk to several people, and I did. And actually, the way you started your contribution is how many of my interlocutors also started theirs. I was never a student of Nira's but. <laughs> and I think this is really something very important that um, Niela was always open to young scholars and activists, whether they were formerly her students or not. And I think this is such an important thing to remember, particularly now that we're uh, we're being so so marketized. Education is yeah so commodity yeah increasingly being commoditized, and um, one of the spaces of um, non-commoditized egalitarian um, sharing of knowledge that Niela very much supported was uh, um, we had an ethnicity, gender, ethnicity and social theory reading group which went on for seven years and which was very much fed, if you will, by Niela's current or former um, MA students, PhD students, but also simply people who'd heard about her um, who were very, many of them actually relocating to the UK and contacted her and, you know, as well as giving her advice and sharing her ideas with them personally, she also said, look, there's also a group, a network that you might want to um, go to. And I think this is something that's, that I find really important, this, um, this idea of collaborating um, beyond, uh, beyond the professional boundaries, actually. Yeah. 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 We had this. My name is Fatma Kaihan. I am one of uh, Nira's students. Mm -hmm. Right. And <coughs> I did my MA in University of East London. Uh, well, I benefit a lot. I just, I want to, I can't go a lot, but just I want to mention one of memory, which I never ever forget. Uh, it was that at the beginning, my MA, in first month, a couple of lecture, I felt, oh, I don't understand anything. I felt bad. I want to, wanted to leave actually, and I just went to uh, Nira's office. I told her, "You talk to me, but not talk." And other things affect me. When she, when in the, she came with me until door and cuddled me. That's <laughs> changed my decision. <laughs> you go and yeah. you. I go first. I didn't say that much, so I thought, no, I'm a bit more talking about uh, the content, and that might be interesting as well as I'm currently teaching or uh, based at a continental European university. Um, and in my experience, and that's 
maybe f for those sometimes struggling with the with the ranking issues. I mean, it's a university that's among the first 200s of the world. Uh, but I have to say, the experience I got here first at Greenwich University, as everyone was basically already mentioning, this inspiration, and as uh, Marcel said, not really in the middle of the road, so more kind of uh, provocative, radical thinking that makes us thinking, um, it's, it's so quite different uh, in comparison to the university I'm working now. Uh, and that, I think, tells a story. I mean, Greenwich perhaps never made it to the ranking, though did, no UEL, actually. Uh, but these are the thoughts and the publications evolving around radical thinking that remain with us and, yeah, are the most inspiring. And, uh, you know, also talking to those who just have done a PhD or probably con thinking of continuing PhD, I think it's a very important niche that uh, education and critical thinking is not absolutely commodified as it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Hello, my name is Gillian Youngs. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to celebrate NERA. Um, I, I'm still a student of NERA's, although I've never been a student of NERA's. Um, I think she is one of those rare academics who, once you pick up her work, and it's important to you, you feel like you're a student of hers. And there are academics like that, but they're incredibly rare. Mm. And my subject was international relations. And um, some of you may know that there is quite a big body of feminist IR in the US, and that field is quite US-centric. So scholars, particularly like Nira, being obviously someone whose reach is global, but being based in Europe, and other scholars like Jindy Petman, who are based in Australia, were really important for feminist IR having a global reach. I mean, I, I cannot underline that enough. And some of you may know of International Feminist Journal of Politics, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of that journal. But without scholars like Nira, I really think that that journal could never have happened. It's now over a decade it's been established. It recently entered the citation indexes, which is really important for scholars. And um, I think that so few scholars have a genuine interdisciplinary reach that gets to students who then become, you know, like our colleague on the panel, I, I never knew I was going to become an academic. And absolutely, people like Nira inspired me to do that. But I think it, it is incredible, scholars who have the power to, to actually continue to inspire you, no matter where you end up. I mean, I was a, an international relations scholar, a globalization scholar, when Nira's work started influencing me. I've now gone on to focus more on digital developments. And throughout all of those, uh, Cynthia Coburn is here today. She's another one of my great influences. I've continued that feminist orientation. And I think it's the transdisciplinary confidence of scholars like Nira who've actually imbued me with that transdisciplinary confidence. In every area I've been in, my feminist scholarship has been on the fringes of the recognition <laughs> for, the, for the academy. Um, because I haven't been lucky enough to get a feminist position like Nira's. But nevertheless, for me, it's been a central part of my identity and my work with my students. And if it wasn't for communities around scholars like Nira, I really don't think that could happen. And I